episode 114, Manifestation Tips and Techniques. Welcome to Gratitude Geek, the relationship marketing podcast, helping micropreneurs find your micro-influencer magic. I'm your host, Candice Rodardi, and this week I'm joined by Ray Hyde Cornell. Ray has been freelancing for more than 15 years. Now she is sharing all of her most powerful business and manifestation tricks and techniques with other freelancers, from barrier-shattering monthly workshops to courses on pricing and client acquisition to private coaching and the group mastermind. Ray has a way to support freelancers, helping some triple their income within one year. Welcome, Ray. Thank you so much for having me, Candice. Can I tell you that my dad's name is Ray? Is it really? Oh. This, is, this is not good. <laughs> I'm sure he spells you, it differently. Though. If I call you dad during the... <laughs> <laughs> I'm okay with it. Tell us your unique story. How'd you get to where you are? Oh, it's interesting because I actually just had a uh, book come out, a multi-author book where I contributed a chapter where I tell this story of really returning to being a freelancer, being a solopreneur. You know, I feel like our society really pushes us to be that office worker, be the bee in the hive. And that was really never me. I was always the hustler. I was always, you know, having multiple gigs, multiple side jobs. I was a flower delivery girl, a Starbucks barista, a soccer referee, a math tutor, a ESL tutor, all the things. And eventually after leaving the overwhelmingly corporate mental health world, I really returned to that freelancing solopreneur spirit. And it's been very much a journey of coming home to the natural energy and vibe that I'm meant to be in. And I think that's true for a lot of freelancers. Okay. I got to know because you open the door. Yeah. Tell us how being a soccer referee may have helped your business. Oh, um, you know, I think as a soccer referee, you make a call and if it's wrong, you still have to stand by it. You can't undo that call. And now as a business owner, when I run a team of about anywhere from 20 to 25 independent contractors, I have my marketing agency where we have anywhere from 20 to 30 clients at a time, you know, I have to make decisions and stand by them. And of course there are times when I can say like, yes, I was wrong. You know, I learned from this, let's go in this different direction, but you really have to stand in that authority position. And like, I was a soccer referee when I was 15 and 16. So this is a long time ago, (laughs) but it's really that being on the spot and being under the pressure where something happens and everyone's looking to you for what's the call, what just happened, what's the rule, how are we going to move forward? Now, how much of that is interpreting the rule? I mean, I'm sure you did not expect to be talking about refereeing oh, no, soccer. <laughs> <That's okay. laughs> but no, but how cool much of that. that is interpreting the rule? Because this is, coming back to business, a lot of yeah. times you have to interpret in all sorts of ways and your yeah. twist your, your, you know, your frame of reference is going to be different than somebody else's. So you have to interpret in a way that's fair and meaningful to everybody. I just answered my own question, but what's your take on that? Yeah, that's a great question. And it's actually funny that you're asking that because this morning I had a conversation with a longtime client of mine and we were talking about her contract and when her contract was up. Cause I, I do six month contracts for retainer services. And she goes, wait, we're at the nine month mark. And I was like, no, we're actually at the six month mark. We did three months of special one-off projects before we started your retainer services. And so in that situation, we both had differing perspectives on the contract And, you know, there's a whole mess of paperwork and admin stuff that we needed to pull from. And I had to reference and I had to say this and this and this, but ultimately it didn't matter. Ultimately, my goal is she needs to feel like she's getting her money's worth, that she's valued, that she's appreciated, and that I am seeing her perspective and not just digging in my heels and trying to be, you know, confrontational. So ultimately, even when you have different perspectives, different interpretations of whatever is going on, that really doesn't matter. The ultimate goal is coming together in a way where everybody's happy and everyone gets what they need. I'm sure that you also appreciate your clients and you show gratitude for them even after conflict. So let's talk about that. 
Yeah. All the time. I am very, I don't want to say affectionate, but that's the word that that comes to mind. I'm, I'm very expressive of my gratitude for my clients and my team. And this goes through, you know, one of the things that I talk about with my clients on the Chiron side, which is where I uh, mentor freelancers and help them build their businesses to be healthier and happier and more profitable. One of the things I talk about is figuring out what your love language is within your business, because we've heard of the five love languages and a lot of people know what there is, is in a romantic setting, but it goes for business as well. And so for some of my clients, that is gifts. And so at Christmas time, I always send gifts to my clients and to my team, different sets of gifts that are very personalized to them. But throughout the year, I'm very verbal, showing them appreciation and recognition for what they're contributing. So for example, with my clients on the copywriting side, if someone does what I ask them to do, which is like, hey, can you send me this information so that I can write your product descriptions? Thank you. Thank you so much for sending those to me. I really appreciate you getting those to me on time. Now we are on schedule and I can have this deliverable to you by. It's like they want to see that they're putting an effort that contributes to getting the ultimate thing that they want done, done. I have a funny story to share along those lines. So I got this box in the mail the other day. I knew where it was from. I I saw the the return address. I was like, what is this? Why, Why are they sending me something in March? My birthday was in January. Oh. And um, this package, it came, came with some sea salt caramels. This package was delivered to me in January, but they must have me in their contact manager twice because they're sending me a birthday card two months later. Um, so they have my birthday wrong in the, in the system. Um, but you know what? I don't care if it's two months late it's, yeah. or, and, and, that I, and that they already sent me a birthday present. I feel really appreciated. Yeah. I feel, I, I feel double appreciated because they thought about me twice. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, exactly. You know, so um, yeah, gifts. I mean, and this, this is actually a gift that I send a lot. I use this service to get to, and I send this particular gift a lot. Um, and it's amazing how much people appreciate yeah. sea salt caramels, <laughs> right? The, the emails things. and the text messages I get from sea salt caramels are amazing. So I call them my sea, sea salt caramels are my secret weapon, um, but I'm happy to share it with anybody who wants to know how I send them, how I send them. Um, okay. I want one of the reasons why I really wanted to have this conversation with you is because you sent me um, when uh, a podcast tip. If you are, want to do a podcast, it's a really good idea to have an intake form so that you know who you're interviewing before you interview them. So in my intake form, you wrote something that I think needs to be in a book. Um, and I would very much, <laughs> I would very much like you to read it for the audience because sure. it's absolutely breathtaking. Yeah, absolutely. So it says we, as a society, don't talk about gratitude enough, particularly in the entrepreneurial world. People are so focused on competition and scarcity. But when you lean into gratitude and realize that there's so much to go around, that there's really no need to fret about competitors, and rather you can be grateful for them because they push you to be better. They give you ideas and inspire you to keep going. Then your life and your business expands beautifully. I'm so grateful, Hinton, that you've dedicated your podcast to this topic. So I left in the part about you talking about me because, you know, it's my show. I can let you talk about me if I want to. But what I love about this quote is I don't believe in competition. I believe in collaboration and colleagues. And there are, you know, as a podcast, this actually happened to me recently. I had someone who pitched me to be a guest on my podcast and he just wasn't he was not a good fit for my show, uh, but I knew somebody that would be a good, good fit. So I introduced him to, to the other podcast host and it was also his birthday. So I sent him a birthday gift. I'm sorry. Nice. You can't, you know, sorry. You're not a good fit for my show. Here's somebody you would be a good fit for and happy birthday. Yeah. <laughs> you know, Perfect. and yeah. I, you know, I don't know if I'll ever be in a position to offer him any of anything else, or he'll ever be able to offer me anything, you know, but in the long run, there may be a point in time where we can collaborate. So yeah. um, I, you know, and for the most part, most 
people who are coming onto podcasts in, in my type of show where I'm interviewing small business owners for small business owners, most of those folks coming on the show are, pod, are uh, podcast hosts or coaches, yeah. you know? Yeah. So I'm a podcast host, host and I'm a coach. So why am I interviewing other coaches? Because not everything that I offer is going to be what the people listening to the show need. Yeah, exactly. And if you have that positive goodwill moving forward, it's going to inspire him to do the same. It's going to give him an idea of how to carry on a relationship that maybe didn't go the way that he thought it was supposed to go or that he wanted it to go, but gives him another example of how you can kind of pay it forward and just continue that kind of rolling ball of positive impact. Exactly. Okay. So let's talk about scarcity and the, the whole top, top topic for this conversation is manifestation. So let's talk about using gratitude to eliminate scarcity and how you can manifest through gratitude. Cause I, I know that's in your wheelhouse. Yeah, absolutely. So I teach a lot about business building, but business building really can't exist if your energy isn't in alignment with that construction of the thing. And a lot of people, when they get into building their own businesses, they get into this scarcity mindset of like, oh no, I am the only one at the helm. All the pressure is on my shoulders, all the responsibilities on my shoulders. I have to be the service provider, the accountant, the marketer, all the things I have to answer the emails. I have to do everything. And they start to feel like I can't do it. What if I can't do it? What if it doesn't work? What if, what if, what if, and they get into this contraction where their energy just kind of sinks into this black hole within themselves. And ultimately it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. If you think I'm never going to get another freelance gig, I'm never going to get another client. Like, how am I going to make all this work? How am I going to pay the bills? How am I going to pay the rent, the mortgage, whatever it is. That's when you start to contract, but you cannot be in scarcity mode at the same time as when you're being grateful, they are in direct opposition of each other when you're grateful. And you can actually feel this. I mean, if you put yourself in this headspace while you're listening to this and you close your eyes and you feel into your body, you can actually feel your energy expanding when you switch into a mindset of gratitude. And when you do that, when you're grateful for one thing, it becomes easier and easier to see all these other things that you have to be grateful for. And then it becomes easier and easier to see all the possibilities. And this sounds like a very woo woo kind of energetic, you know, we're talking about the word manifestation kind of thing, but actually it's deeply rooted in science. There's a structure in your brain called the reticular activating system that is designed to help you see more of the same. So it's kind of like if you're ever, let's say it's summer and you're looking at the grass and you see an ant. And then you really look at that ant and then you notice, oh, there's another one. And then there's another one. Oh my God. And now you're surrounded by ants. That's that system in your brain. And the same thing works for opportunities in business. Like when you buy a car and all of a sudden every car you see on the road is the same as yours. Yes, exactly. Because you don't notice it. Yeah. Until you have that first introduction. And you're in tune with it. Exactly. And so gratitude, that practice of gratitude is you choosing it's you self-programming getting in tune with the things that you want to see more of in your life so i have a quote and i'm going to put it on a t-shirt one day gratitude is like manure it's just a pile of crap unless you spread it around because really <laughs> i mean really i mean when you spread gratitude you can plant yeah. seeds and more grat- more things to be appreciative of will grow so yeah. you got to spread that shit everywhere Right? (laughs) I love it. (laughs) I'm putting it on a t shirt. Don't steal my quote. (laughs) Nope. I'll buy a t shirt. Send me a link when they're available. I love it. I love it. All right. So, you, um, you you already touched on it a little bit, but talk to me about how, when you're communicating with your team members and your, your clients and your colleagues, how do you infuse gratitude then? You know, over time, it becomes an automatic response. It's any time I notice that somebody is sending something to me, whether it's, you know, I have this incredible designer on my team who she is just always coming up with ideas. She sends me an idea. Oh my God, this is amazing. Thank you. A client sends me something that I need for a project. They send me their payment, whatever it is. Thank you. It's anytime you receive something, it's almost like completing the cycle 
So when someone sends you something, send something in return. Sometimes that's a thank you card. Sometimes that's a birthday gift. Sometimes it's just the words, thank you. It's this reciprocation of energy that allows you to continue to kind of like pour into people as they pour into you. And I had this conversation with uh, one of my team members uh, about a year ago, because we were working on some logo designs for Chiron and we were kind of trying to come up with a, a new concept for one of the programs. And she goes, well, what if we take the arrow and we have the arrow shooting off and then like landing in the, in the ground. And I was like, well, I like that you want to incorporate the arrow because that's a big part of our branding, but I don't believe it ever needs to come down to the ground. Because when we're all pouring into each other, it's like this infinite loop of just spiraling upwards and we're all raising each other up. We never need to come back down unless the gratitude, the appreciation, the reciprocation stops. And so it's like this physics defying energetic whirlwind that just feels so good to be a part of. Do you shoot archery? Yes, I do. I have a bow. It's in the room next door to me. <laughs> so, um, you, you may be better at archery than I am. It's been over 10 years since I picked up a bow, but I started shooting when I was about four years old. And then oh, I wow. taught archery for, I don't know, six years or so. Uh, but it's again, it's been 10 years since I picked a bow, picked up a bow, but here's the thing about archery. When you aim at your target, there are so many factors other than the bow, the arrow and you that affect how that, that arrow is gonna land on the target. So you really need to shoot to see how those external factors are gonna affect so that you can aim again and, and get to the target. Um, and I, I really, I love using that analogy for business because if you never, if you spend so much time aiming mm -hmm. and you never fire the bow, yep. you're never gonna know if the arrow is gonna hit the target. Yep. So you've got to aim, you got to fire and you, you got to just keep adjusting your aim. So I, yeah. I love your, I love the arrow, I love the bow and I love the, I love your branding. So, well, where did you come up with that idea of the bow? Obviously you shoot. So talk to me about your branding. Yeah, actually uh, the bow and arrow came from the name. Chiron Consulting is named after Chiron, which is a Greek myth about this half man, half horse creature who was abandoned by his parents in the forest, somehow survived. Eventually, I'm giving you the Cliff Notes version here, eventually was adopted by Apollo, who taught him medicine, archery, um, the art, the things. And then Chiron went on to be the trainer for some of the world's greatest heroes, like Achilles, Hercules, Ajax. And that's really my mission at Chiron is I believe everyone is the hero of their own story. And my goal is just to be your trainer. You haven't the ticks and the client management tools and the client acquisition and the positioning and all of these things that you need while also healing things like your money mindset, all of the energetics that go into being a solopreneur. Let me help you with that. So you really can take off and be that hero of your own story where you are self-sufficient. It's been a long time since I've read about Chiron and, and mm -hmm. Achilles and um, Hercules. But what I do know, if I, what I do remember is that he treated each of those students differently because they each had a different skill set. Yes. And that is a way, that, a way to approach business as well. Exactly. I don't have a cookie cutter approach. Every single person I work with, we cater their business, the tools that we implement, their marketing strategies, everything to who they are, because that's the only way it's going to work. And so just for clarification, you have two businesses, you have your content yes. marketing business, which is Cornell, mm -hmm. and then your consulting business, which is Chiron. And in Chiron, your target market is freelancers. Yes. I work with freelancers and self-employed creatives. And with Cornell... We work with B2B businesses, or I'm sorry, we work B2B with B2C businesses. So most of my clients on the Cornell side are subscription-based businesses or product-based businesses. Okay. So subscription-based businesses, let's talk about that because I've noticed that everybody is getting a little bit of my money these days. <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> so where do you see subscription-based businesses going in the future? 
Oh, it's massive. It's absolutely massive. So there's an organization that I'm a part of called the Subscription Trade Association, SUBTA. And they have these five pillars of the subscription industry. And it's interesting because often we think of subscriptions as like, you know, I'm subscribed to BarkBox and I'm subscribed to um, Mindful Souls and, you know, things like that. But there are also memberships. There are also things like Peloton, where you buy the equipment once, but then you have a membership. There's things like Orange Theory Fitness. And then there are online communities that are memberships. For example, I have a membership where people get access to all of my workshops, all of my courses, every single thing that I have released, will release, they get access to it all. That's a membership for a monthly fee. And almost every business, even ones that you wouldn't think could have a subscription model are moving in that direction. And a lot of people, you know, I feel like this was almost sparked by the wave of minimalism that hit with tiny homes and things like that about eight to 10 years ago, where it's less about ownership and it's more about usership. People don't necessarily want to own things anymore. They just want to use things while they need them, pay a lower fee, and then trade them in for the next great thing when it comes along. We're uh, recording this in March of 2022, and it's going to drop in April of 2022. So I'm not sure what's going to happen in the next few weeks, right? Uh, But right now we're in the middle, the world is in the middle of a potential world war. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And I, my family literally sat down and we talked about, you know, my, our daughter's 23 years old. She's going to head off to graduate school soon, but we really talked about what are we going to do? What's going to, what are we going to do? Should we stock up on some food just in case, you know? And we pretty much decided that, nah, we're not going to do that. (laughs) If the world's going to end, the world's going to end. 10 years ago, I wouldn't have said that though, but the whole minimalism thing really is affecting the way people think. It, It is amazing to me how cultures shift by tiny idea. Tiny ideas can shift a culture. And yes. minimalism was a tiny idea, literally and figuratively, that has shifted <laughs> the way Americans and people around the world think. Um, and 10 yeah. years ago, I would have been stocking up and having making sure I had supplies. And I'm like, nah. <laughs> Well, and it's a contribution of a lot of different factors, because in addition to the the trend of minimalism, innovation has gotten so fast where they're coming out with new things, new cars, new phones. There's, I don't know, what are they, iPhone 65 or something at this point? There's just new iterations and people want the newest. So they want minimalism, but they also want newness and in combining those, even companies like Volvo, Volvo has a subscription where you can subscribe to a car and it includes your maintenance, your insurance, everything. Get out. Really? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I wrote an article about it for Subta. Yeah. Does that include getting a new car every two years? Yeah. It- yep. Uh, it's, um, it's not every two years. I think it's something like every six months. You get a new car every six months? Yeah. It's something like that. Yep. Do you remember yeah. how much it costs? Um, I looked it up for a friend who was thinking about getting a new car. I was like, why don't you just rent from Volvo? And I think it was like $350 a month. Are you kidding me? I could be wrong on that, but that's what I remember from my research. Yeah. Okay. Gratitudegeek.com episode (laughs) number 114. I'm one of those people who finds answers. So by the time this drops, I will know the answer to that question. And the answer will be in the show notes. Gratitudegeek.com episode 114. Yeah. (laughs) Absolutely. I mean, it's a great model and please correct my numbers on that. Cause I did that article about a year ago. And so I could be misremembering, but it's a great model for people who they want the newest car. They don't want to have to worry about when a car starts to break down six years into ownership. Wow. So what, what do they do with the other car with the old cars? They just rotate them out almost like a lease. It's very much like a lease model, but they're making it a subscription by bundling your car insurance, your maintenance, everything. So the, the, uh, the frugal person, I'm extremely frugal. The frugal person in me is like, we build too many cars as it is. Yeah. We've got to figure out a way to make them last longer. And the fact right. that you get a new car every six months seems to me wasteful. <laughs> right. Yeah. Unless those cars have a good purpose and they're going to a good use. I don't know. All right. We need to wrap up soon, but is there anything that, that we haven't yet talked about that you would like to share? I think the only other thing that I, I want to share is sometimes people are very afraid to show their appreciation and it can feel almost like an intimate moment when you say, 
thank you to someone for something, especially if it's someone you don't really know, or maybe you have a very formal business relationship with, but the great thing about gratitude is there are varying degrees of your expression. You can just say the words, you can type the words, you could go give someone a hug, you could give them a gift, you could give them a gift that's $5, $500, there's a spectrum. And so because gratitude is so powerful, honestly, I believe everybody needs it in their life, every moment of every day. It's the antidote to pessimism. It's the antidote to scarcity. It's the antidote to everything negative that we want to get rid of in our lives. So just start somewhere, wherever you are most comfortable. Say thank you to your dog when he gives you a little lick on the hand, anything. Just start wherever you're comfortable. Eventually make it a reflex where anytime you receive something, you're showing your gratitude in some way. And it's contagious too. You start yeah. showing gratitude and other people start showing gratitude. And the next thing you know, you've manifested a, you know, this ripple of gratitude and you don't even know where it started. It absolutely is. And, and I'll tell you a quick little story. When I first started dating, who is now my husband, um, I, my father-in-law, now father-in-law, um, he did something for us. I can't remember. It was something very small. And I said, hey, thanks so much, Dave. And he goes, oh, you don't have to thank me. We're family. And I'm like, that's all the more reason for me to thank you. And also while I'm at it, thank you for calling me family. Like that's huge. Thank you. And now he is so much more expressive of his gratitude. He doesn't miss an opportunity to say thank you. And it's almost like I had to break down that little barrier with him where he felt like saying thank you was too much of like an intimate thing to say. I'm like, dude, I appreciate you. That's all it is. Like, thank you so much for, for doing this and for saying this and for welcoming me into your family. And now he's more comfortable with showing his gratitude. It really is contagious. Like you said, my husband will often tell me that the reason he married me is because of my mother. Oh God. So was your father in law? Was she, that's actually good because it means my mom yeah. is pretty cool. Right. So yeah. how much, how um, influential was your father-in-law in the way that he felt made you feel appreciated and, and included affect you wanting to be part of that family? Oh, I, I, and I could talk about this all day long. Um, so my husband and I were both very, anti-marriage. We were just terrified of the idea. Not so much. It wasn't that we were afraid of the commitment and actually being married. We were afraid of the wedding. We were afraid of getting our families together. We were afraid of the drama and my in-laws, ultimately my husband and I eloped. Um, and my in-laws were just so warm, so welcoming. They just I mean, my mother-in-law calls me her daughter. They were just so gracious and open that I had no problem marrying this man who I just felt immediately drawn into his family. And all we had to then figure out was, okay, how do we get married without getting our families together? Because those groups together is not going to be pretty. So we eloped on a cruise ship in Vancouver on our way to the Alaska uh, glaciers and all of that. <laughs> but it was a huge, huge, um, how should I say, like um, it, it broke down a barrier by my in-laws being so warm and welcoming. That was one less thing that we had to fight against in this like we want to be together, but how do we actually go about it kind of puzzle? Did a captain marry you, the captain of the cruise ship? It wasn't the captain. No, we had a female officiant um, who I can't for the life of me remember her name or I think the, the event coordinator on the ship found her. It, it was a very simple wedding with like four people in the room. It was just, let's get it done and let's celebrate. Cause all we wanted to do was be married. We didn't want to have a wedding. <laughs> Sounds perfect to me. Yeah, it was <laughs> wonderful. And then we got to spend two weeks exploring Alaska and Denali in the wilderness together. So it was just fantastic. We need to wrap up and now's your chance to share your moment of gratitude for whom or what are you most grateful? Oh, I have to say, I am so, 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 so grateful for my team. Two ladies in particular, one is about to go on maternity leave. Her name's Alyssa. And we have this amazing uh, designer who really stepped up. She saw an opportunity. She wanted to work more closely with me and she put her hat in the ring and she goes, I think I could do Alyssa's job. And I was like, all right, let's see what you got. And she has stepped up. She has thrown ideas out there that have just been 
a huge hit, a huge success. She is so supportive, so creative. And Alyssa, who's the one who's on her way out for maternity leave, she's just been so protective of me, wanting to make sure I'm very taken care of while she's gone. And so I just feel so lucky and so grateful to have these two incredible women taking care of me while I take care of my businesses to ideally take care of my clients as best I can. I just feel very supported and very grateful. Thanks for joining us this week for Gratitude Geek, the relationship marketing podcast, helping micropreneurs find your micro influencer magic. Be sure to check the show notes at gratitudegeek.com episode 114 for links to all the groovy resources mentioned today. And of course, to connect with Ray Hyde Cornell. And while you're there, why not subscribe to the show on Audible, iTunes, Stitcher, or any of your favorite podcast players. Our theme music is track 14 by Rev Brock and Soul Lily. I've been your host, Candice Girardi. Join me on my mission to spread gratitude, sow seeds of appreciation, and harvest a bounty of generosity and kindness. Stay groovy, my friends. 